Welcome to this edition by Union Solidarity International. We are absolutely delighted to be joined from America today by Tim Beattie, the Director of Global Strategies of the Teamsters. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us, brother. It's great to be here, Andrew, and congratulations on the work of Union Solidarity International. Uh, I'm regularly getting your updates now and uh, very interested in the work that you're doing and happy to see that you're building these links between unions worldwide. It's absolutely necessary. Thanks for doing this. Pleasure and thanks for those kind words indeed. I'd really like to kick off today's conversation by actually talking about the poster that's behind you, the Stop the War on Workers. Now, from the UK and Ireland, we've seen over a number of years the concerted efforts by Republicans and their corporate associates to try and, in essence, decollectivise workers and to dilute their terms and conditions in America. We've seen very famous examples such as in Wisconsin. Do you want to just give us a little bit more detail on the campaign and what the Teamsters are doing? Well, um, after the, the last midterm elections, the Republican Party gained majorities and the governor's house in a number of states around the United States and, and began an a effort, a coordinated effort to try and strip uh, away uh, collective bargaining rights for public sector workers uh, around uh, the United States. We saw it particularly in the Midwest, first in Wisconsin, and I think the coverage there across the labor movement was uh, was wide about the, the fight back that the workers in Wisconsin did against uh, uh, Governor Scott Walker, and, and then it extended to Indiana. We've seen it more, most recently in Michigan. And uh, not only were these efforts to strip away uh, bargaining rights for public sector workers, but uh, uh, trying to change legislation was going to make it harder for workers to organize in the private sector as well. So uh, this is the, the latest of what's been an assault on the, the labor movement that started back with, uh, with Ronald Reagan when he fired the air traffic controllers in 1980 and coming all the way forward to today. It's had an impact on the, uh, on the U.S. labor movement. We've, uh, we've lost uh, uh, density. We've lost uh, uh, membership, but we're uh, we're in a fight back mode. And uh, our campaign to stop the war on workers, Teamsters are mobilized around the the country. Certainly in uh, in, in the in the latest fights in, in places like Michigan and, and Wisconsin uh, uh, to fight back. So we're joining with our uh, public sector membership and unions, uh, other unions in the U.S. to stand together to try and put an end to this uh, uh, offensive by the. Uh, uh, by the Republicans and their uh, and their lackeys from the um, uh, from the corporate world that are spending so much money to try and strip away our rights. I think one of the key things that's affecting if affecting all working people in the U.S. is the is the growing gap between rich and poor. Uh, because it's becoming harder for uh, some parts of, of the labor movement to first organize into unions and then uh, to collectively bargain, what we're winding up with is more and more of the wealth being a being created in the country going to the, the richest 1%. And so what we saw in the Occupy movement and what we see in our effort to stop the war on workers, the, the impact uh, that these policies are having is to concentrate wealth among a smaller group of people in the United States and that's slowing down uh, economic growth in the U.S. because uh, those richest don't spend a big percentage of their money the way that working people do. And so we need to rebalance our economy uh, towards uh, towards uh, working people. And that's uh, that's part of what we're doing when we say we want to stop the war on workers. Thanks for those comments. I find that very fascinating. In actual fact, a lot of similarities between the U.K. and Ireland and the United States. The whole issue of public sector workers and private sector workers and how our opponents in the corporate world and political opponents try and pit public sector workers against private sector workers and what's happened in a number of states in, in America of course is an attack on all workers because if public sector workers lose their rights their terms and conditions are diluted then that has obvious knock-on effects in the private sector as well where everybody's wages and terms and conditions are driven towards the bottom and a really topical issue in the UK and in Ireland at the moment as well Tim is what you just referred to that even though there may be signs in terms of percentages of GDP growth where is that wealth being distributed 
we are seeing in the UK and in Ireland and what you're referring to in the United States is that if there is small signs of economic growth then it is being concentrated in the one percent and those are issues that we in the UK and Ireland can certainly resonate with and and see that we're all facing the same issues across the globe. Now I'm really interested in your school bus campaign because in actual fact it involves UK companies if I'm correct those being yes, okay. First Group and National Express and I know that this is a, a massive campaign that's got so much public support and that you've been getting support from trade unions in particular Unite from. Do you want to explain to our viewers what this campaign is about? So. Um the student transportation system in the U.S. is a separate system from the public transportation system, and, and uh, as students are transported in the U.S. Uh, by a dedicated system, you know it by the yellow buses. You see them on yeah. American movies, that kind of thing. So this uh, this yellow bus uh, system is uh, run by the school boards across the United States, and uh, in many school boards, they've decided to contract out the operation of the. Uh, school uh, student transportation to uh, private companies and the two largest operators of private uh, school buses in the United States are both uh, uh, UK owned companies uh, First Group and, uh, and National Express and over the last eight years we've been uh, involved in a campaign with, uh, uh, with drivers and uh, uh, bus maintenance folks to try and raise the standards for uh, workers in this sector because what happens when the school board contracts out uh, these jobs the private operators try and drive down the the wages and the standards so uh, this campaign has been uh, quite successful we've uh, uh, brought more than 30,000 workers uh, into uh, membership with the Teamsters uh, with collective bargaining agreements that have been successful in driving up uh, wages and benefits for uh, a group of workers that uh, that absolutely need uh, union representation. Uh, but currently we're having uh, a huge difficulty with uh, uh, National Express, a uh, UK-owned uh, company that also operates in, uh, in Spain, in Canada, and in, uh, uh, in, in Morocco. And uh, recently General President Hoff uh, had, a, had a meeting with uh, Dean Finch, the CEO of National Express where we said hey let's uh, let's try and work together uh, National Express has used the worst forms of uh, union busting tactics uh, they uh, uh, aren't investing in uh, uh, health uh, and safety uh, around the buses the way that uh, that they that they should and so uh, c can we create a different kind of a, a relationship and uh, uh, Dean Finch and his uh, US CEO uh, David Duke uh, said no uh, uh, we're not interested in a, in a, in a better relationship with uh, uh, with the union that represents bus drivers in the in the United States very unfortunate but uh, uh, the unite and uh, and RMT unions in the in, in the UK have been extremely helpful uh, in our in our campaign to try and organize uh, those workers we uh, went together uh, with Unite and RMT to a um, uh, a meeting of the the annual general meeting of the shareholders of uh, of uh, of National Express uh, a few months back in in London, uh, joined by our British colleagues and together uh, bus drivers from uh, the U.S. representatives of the Teamsters and representatives of of National Express workers uh, in in the U.K. all went to the shareholders and raised our concerns about the behavior of the company. Uh, in the in the U.S. operations, and uh, uh, while this campaign continues, we've got support from our colleagues in Britain, from our colleagues in uh, in Spain, and uh, we need National Express to take uh, a different view uh, towards its uh, social dialogue with uh, with workers in the in the United States. And uh, uh, right now, we've got a number of campaigns around the United States where National Express is. Uh, deploying the sort of worst kind of union busting tactics that the, you see in the United States to uh, to mob, to discourage, to uh, influence. We've had problems with even uh, firings, people moving from uh, uh, good uh, routes to uh, uh, bad routes, uh, lower paid routes, uh, all kinds of pressure from management to try and discourage folks from uh, from joining the union. Bobby Morton from 
uh, the uh, Unite uh, from the passenger transport section, uh, Makarata from the International Transport Workers Federation, which is also based there in London, uh, have been very supportive. They came recently on a delegation with colleagues from from Germany, from Verdi in Germany, and from uh, uh, EVG in Germany, because uh, 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 National Express is about to uh, open up. Uh, um, operations in Germany as well. So international support for U.S. workers that are trying to uh, defend their work rights at the workplace in the in the school bus sector in the United States. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. Now, what I think is particularly interesting about that, Tim, is that I don't think a lot of the, the movement here about the cooperation across continents, particularly when a company is operating in different countries around the world and is treating its workers less favourably than in other areas and that example which you've just highlighted with respect to the, the school bus campaign I think is a very important message for our movement that needs to be heard and given oxygen about the close work that brothers and sisters are doing around the world to try and help each other with respect to negotiations with companies and to try and ensure that they get uh, a better deal. And this is all deja vu for people in the UK and in Ireland with respect to the deregulation and the privatisation of the transport sector and in particular yeah. the buses. And in actual fact, we featured in one of our daily outrages just a couple of weeks ago how hundreds of workers in Dublin and the Republic of Ireland were also out in strike as a result of the government's endeavours to privatise a lot of the links. So we would encourage Teamsters members to check that out and to learn a bit more about some of the transport struggles that workers are going through at the moment. But turning to my attention to the international work of the Teamsters, which I certainly found very fascinating and is music to my ears, is your recent agreement on behalf of Change to Win, which your president went and signed with the, the Brazilian Confederation, UGT, about closer working relationships, about sharing ideas, best practice, and on the activities of corporations. Do you want to just tell our viewers a little bit more about this agreement, which I think is absolutely fantastic? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, uh, But just your comment, I, the... Um uh, the suggestion that you make that we ought to take a look at the experience of the British workers in the process of privatization is absolutely uh, prescient. It's something that we uh, need to do more of. We are uh, absolutely 100% uh, thankful for the solidarity that we've received from uh, British unions, from Unite uh, in particular, uh, on, the, on the school bus uh, campaign. And it is the basis of what we want to do uh, on solidarity, uh, international global solidarity in the union movement these days. I mean, there was a point in time when it had to do a lot with, uh, you know, uh, solidarity, uh, 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 but it, almost in a sense of, of, of charity. There was a lot more diplomacy. There was a lot more geopolitics. These days, we're in a globalized economy in which uh, workers in the U.S. and workers in the U.K. and workers uh, uh, all over the world are uh, dealing with the same multinational employers, a lot of times trying to deploy similar kinds of anti-worker uh, tactics in order to uh, increase their profits. And so when we are able to uh, get to know each other and to begin to understand each other's fights, uh, then we can begin to work together in order to counterbalance uh, these multinational corporations, these behemoths that uh, are able to bring so much power, money, influence to bear uh, because we're able to then respond in a coordinated way. We like to talk about simultaneous solidarity. We like to talk about the idea that uh, we want to try and solve our problems and we want you to solve your problems and can we work at the same time to solve both of our problems by agitating together in some coordinated activity that can make a difference uh, across borders for us and for you. We, uh, we just heard very positive news over a campaign in Turkey, just to give you an example about uh, organizing uh, partial delivery workers in 
uh, DHL, the large German multinational. A couple of years ago, uh, our leadership, including uh, uh, General Secretary Treasurer Ken Hall, uh, worked very hard in order to uh, influence UPS, the big parcel carrier in the United States, to respect worker rights in Turkey, uh, uh, who had been or trying to organize workers uh, at, at UPS and successfully uh, got union recognition and a contract after a a long fight and now that same union Tumtis in Turkey is organizing workers at DHL workers that do the same work for a different multinational company and I think uh, we're gonna see I just heard from the International Transport Workers Federation that we we may have a breakthrough there as well we've been working with the Germans and unions all across the world in order to send a message to DHL that they needed to recognize uh, the rights of those workers in Turkey to form a union if they wanted to well this is the the same kind of stuff that we think about in our conversations with unions around the world. So uh, when when our uh, coalition partners in Change to Win uh, identified and began to work with the Brazilian labor movement, we were looking at concrete solidarity. We're looking at ways that the uh, Brazilians and the Americans could work together. And the UGT has really stepped forward, for example, on the campaign of our sister union, UFCW, around Walmart. And of course, this is a fight that's not just in the United States, but Walmart's one of the largest companies in the world. Absolutely. And, and so when, when a Walmart uh, uh, doesn't give workers in their stores in the United States the right to, to organize, uh, uh, workers around the world have now stand, stood up in solidarity. And the UGT has been one of those unions that's been standing up in solidarity with workers at Walmart's in in Brazil. You've got on your front page what Walmart is doing in Mexico right now, putting a... Uh, um, uh, a store right by one of the most important historical sites, Teotihuacan, uh, 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 some miles outside of, of Mexico City. Uh, this kind of activity by this multinational corporation, they don't have to care about workers' rights, they don't have to care about cultural heritage, they don't care about people in many ways. Uh, it's the coordinated effort among unions that's going to make a difference, and that's the basis of uh, the agreement that uh, uh, President Hoffa signed with uh, uh, with President Patah from the UGT a couple of weeks back is that uh, we just want to confirm that we're going to continue to work together uh, between Brazil and the United States. It's a it's a growing economy. It's uh, 200 million people live there. It's a it's a labor movement that uh, still remember in the 1980s. Lula was there. Uh, President we, uh, recently the Workers Party was built out of the uh, of the work of the of the labor movement. So it's a dynamic labor movement and we're, like, we're happy to continue a partnership and sort of formalize it and with this agreement. Jim signing on behalf of the uh, Change to Win Coalition and uh, uh, working together uh, with Brazil to try and uh, uh, build uh, 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 this kind of uh, concrete simultaneous solidarity that helps workers in Brazil and in the United States. That's absolutely fantastic to hear, and as I mentioned earlier, music to my ears certainly. And if you don't mind, Tim, I'm going to borrow your phrase, simultaneous solidarity. I think that's an absolutely brilliant way to phrase the relationships that we need to be developing with brothers and sisters around the world. Meaningful. No copyright. You're welcome to. <laughs> Good. Everything gets copyrighted these days, so I'm pleased that you're not applying it. Talking about some of your other international work and I know free trade agreements are a big issue between North and South America in particular and nobody can fail to be moved and to see the massive protests that have been going on in Colombia over a number of weeks now and also bearing in mind the, the free trade agreement that was signed a number of years ago that I know our movement in America was very concerned about with respect to the loss of manufacturing jobs. Do you want to give us a little bit more information about the Teamsters' positions on the free trade agreements that are ongoing and are being discussed at the moment and the situation in Colombia, which I know your president has been speaking about recently? Yeah, he has the situation in Colombia. We've seen protests this week in um uh, in Bangladesh, uh, tens of thousands of folks out on the street in, in Bangladesh, also a result of some of the same sort of uh, uh, policies. Now, you know, the, the Teamsters and workers in general, I think we don't have any objection to uh, the idea of enhancing trade between uh, between countries uh, for the mutual benefit of workers uh, in, in, in both sides. The, the problem with the uh, uh, 
the trade agreements as they've been negotiated uh, recently from our perspective is that they're not so much about trade. They're, they're more about a, a set of rules that protect corporations from government regulation. Uh, they make it easier for corporations to uh, 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 sue uh, governments when governments are trying to make take democratic decisions to protect their environment or uh, to protect uh, people people's health or uh, to have uh, you know sort of reasonable costs for certain kinds of of goods like uh, like prescription drugs uh, things like that so uh, the vast majority of these agreements have nothing to do with sort of what you think about when you think of trade sort of what the you know what the quota is going to be or isn't going to be and how much can come in or go out it has a lot more to do with a whole bunch of other rules that are mostly influenced by uh, by multinational corporations and uh, it's their voice that's being heard, not the voice of workers, and so it's it's not working people's interests uh, that are being represented in these negotiations. Unfortunately, uh, I wish we could have uh, trade that uh, that made it. Uh, uh, that started from the basis of driving up standards for workers in both countries or the multiple countries that are being uh, uh, involved with the negotiation at this point. But that's not what's the table. These. Uh, negotiations when they go on there'll be a whole phalanx of, of, of corporate lobbyists uh, that actually have influence and are invited in sometimes by these governments to to be right by the side of the negotiators but nothing like that happens to anybody else working people or others uh, these negotiations are mostly done in secret and they're done in secret certainly for example this TPP this Trans-Pacific Partnership being negotiated right now it's all done in secret we can only get leaks sometimes about what's being negotiated uh, in these agreements they have no idea right until the end and then they want to in the US do a, a straight up or down vote they don't want to have any influence by uh, by legislators by Congress in the US by the House and the Senate over uh, what the particular rules inside these free to tr uh, inside these agreements should be so uh, Jim Hoffa has been out uh, talking about fair trade he's been talking about the idea that trade can be very good for working people but only when it makes the rules uh, such that uh, uh, working people and the rules that apply in trade uh, uh, drive standards up, uh, not drive standards down to the bottom. And Jim recently signed uh, an, an article uh, with the uh, the head of the Sierra Club. So this is something where the labor movement and uh, uh, the environmental movement have been working together. We see the same problem with uh, the way these negotiations are going. Back in '99, uh, the Teamsters were present uh, in uh, a fight in Seattle uh, to try and bring attention to the world to the what was the the, the negotiation over the WTO, and they talked a lot about. Teamsters and and turtles. They talk about the idea of the the labor movement and the environmental movement uh, working together uh, to try and uh, create standards that were going to uh, uh, better uh, the living for uh, for folks uh, uh, around the world. And that's not what happened. What's happening in these agreements uh, right now? And so you know we're uh, we're very concerned about what's going on with the negotiations with the Trans Pacific Partnership. We think what's happened in past agreements between the United States and Mexico, NAFTA, now coming up on 20-year anniversary, and more recently with uh, uh, with Central America, and then with uh, Colombia and the Andean region. I mean, what's happened in a number of these countries is that you've seen the same kind of uh, unbalanced growth, where a certain percentage, a very small percentage at the top of the population, is uh, benefiting greatly from uh, the new rules. But that working people and lower-income people in uh, in Mexico and in Central America are uh, are not benefiting from what's going on with uh, with this trade because the rules make it harder for the government to spread out uh, the wealth among uh, among all the people in the uh, uh, in the population and it's concentrated uh, in the very wealthy folks uh, in uh, uh, you know in the places where these trade agreements under these set of rules have been have been signed most recently and that's why you see the protests that you're seeing in Colombia these days it's because small farmers small producers small businesses uh, are not seeing the benefit of the trade and in fact what's happening is that they're being driven out of business uh, by the larger corporations because they were the ones involved with setting these rules and so while people don't pay as so much attention to these things because they seem sort of 
out of the way the Colombian people are now beginning to feel what's going on uh, with these uh, with these rules that benefit certain groups uh, of the uh, of the population in Colombia and and not others some stuff that we've been seeing in the United States ever since uh, after the free trade agreement with Mexico and Canada was signed uh, was signed 20 years ago so uh, that's why Jim uh, and the teachers are out talking about these issues these days because the U.S. is involved with uh, negotiating an agreement right now with 13 countries in Asia, and they've just introduced Andrew this idea of of a, a, a an agreement between uh, the U.S. and uh, and the European Union. Yeah, but of course that's. And again, we're very concerned about the the way that these rules are are going to the way these negotiations are going to happen. Our work people and their union is going to be consulted uh, in the process of figuring out what these rules should be. We said to the government quite early, when, just after they announced this, we'd like to see, for example, our weak labor laws be brought up to the standards of, uh, of what we see in, in, uh, in some parts of in, in, in Europe. And uh, you know, the response was sort of uh, a silent because what's really going on here is this is mostly a corporate agenda that's driving these negotiations, unfortunately. Tim, I think that's a perfect place to end this first conversation, one of many that we hope to have with you and the Teamsters in the, the months and years to come. Some really critical and crucial issues about the activities of corporations across the world, the implications of free trade agreements, and the absolutely fantastic work that has been done by labour unions across the world to support each other's campaigns to ensure that standards are driven up and not driven down. So it only leaves me to thank you, brother, for your contribution today and all our solidarity to the Teamsters. Thanks very much. Hey, congratulations for the work that USI is doing, Andrew, and the work that you're doing uh, personally. Congratulations.